When I was born, my dad called my Nana from the delivery room, excited to share the news. She's here, and you'll be happy to know she's white. This was a relief to my Nana. My mom was white, and my dad was black. It was 1983, so their marriage was very much a problem, especially growing up in Texas. My maternal grandfather never met my dad. When my dad passed away in a car accident one year later, my family lied and told my grandfather he was Spanish. For my racist grandfather, being the descendant of a Latin European was better than being black. I was light enough to pass, so we stuck with this story until my grandfather died nine years later. I grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas. By the time I was 14, I mostly adopted this narrative. I didn't want to be Spanish, though. In, the, in Corpus Christi, the land of Selena, I was Mexican. This was easy for me to do. I learned all of the Selena songs by heart and practiced her dance moves. I wore chanclas, I ate menudo one time, that was enough, <laughs> and leaned in to Mexican culture. The summer before my sophomore year of high school, my mom pulled me aside and said my paternal grandfather, Clarence, wanted to meet me. He and his new wife, Tina, were coming to visit me for the first time ever. I didn't know much about my black side, only that when my dad died, his father refused to pay for the funeral, leaving my mother to cover all the expenses. My exposure to black people was limited. What little I knew about them, about us, I learned from the media. Movies and TV taught me they were typically dangerous criminals to be avoided and loved rap music. I loved R&B, but when I played my salt and pepper or Silk CDs, my mom got upset, calling it vulgar sex music and forced me to throw them in the trash. This made me think black people, black culture, wasn't safe for me to participate in. Leading up to our first meeting, I was excited and nervous. It felt like an audition to be their granddaughter and I wanted to land the part. Tina started writing to me. Over the next few weeks, I received, received her long handwritten letters with details about her and my grandfather's life. They lived in New Mexico, they loved going on long road trips in their RV, and my grandfather still enjoyed working on cars, a hobby he and my dad shared while he was still alive. I thought maybe I could learn how to work on cars too, I collected car-related questions I could ask him when we finally met. Tina also let me in on a secret. She said my grandfather was nervous about meeting me. He wasn't sure how it would go, but Tina assured him it would be great, and now he was brimming with excitement. Tina was on a mission to make us a family, and I was happy to see someone taking initiative. Tina was the one leading the charge. I was used to seeing women call the shots. My mom was a powerhouse and had multiple marriages. In all of them, she was a leader and the men followed. <laughs> so this made sense. I was the exotic one in my family and they never let me forget it. A beautiful mulatto, they would prop up on a pedestal like their little brown doll. I always felt like an outsider. It was a constant reminder that I wasn't like them. I was an other. I had curves at a young age and my family made fun of my big, bouncy ass, nickname me water butt. <laughs> the other nickname my family loved was Ambush because of my curly hair. I didn't like it. I did everything I could to avoid being black, holding my tongue and laughing with the other kids when they made disparaging comments about black people. If someone thought I was Mexican, Egyptian, or Puerto Rican, I wouldn't correct them. No one ever guessed I was black, and I was not going to be the one to point it out. I chose to pass at school and among friends. I was hiding in plain sight, aware of the anti-blackness around me. Then the day arrived. Clarence and Tina stepped into our house and I was shocked at how small and sweet they were. Like two brown garden gnomes <laughs> with big smiles and calming energy. All the adults I knew were big, aggressive, tired, annoyed, and sick of loud kids. Clarence and Tina were different. I didn't know black people could feel so safe and be so calm. They spoke slowly and they made eye contact with me. I liked them. They invited me out for lunch and sightseeing. We visited the USS Lexington, a World War II Navy ship that I pretended to be knowledgeable about. <laughs> I wanted to impress them and I spent most of the day sharing my kid resume. Clarence had dark blue eyes and chocolate brown skin a combination I didn't even know existed. 
I was happy to be related to him. His energy felt familiar to me. There was a sweetness in him that also existed in me. But I lived in a house that required me to be vigilant and guarded for survival. I had to tuck away my sweetness and vulnerability. It was nice to take a break and be the real me. They asked me lots of questions about my life, school, and what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wanted to be an actress, a singer, and a lawyer in that order. <laughs> I loved to perform, and I wanted to try multiple avenues to master my craft. I felt seen, and I liked that they took so much interest in me. I was happy to have a new family to connect to. I liked the part of me that missed my dad was partially filled with Clarence and Tina. It wasn't like the relationship I had with my mom. That was strained and complicated. My time with them felt like a calm oasis in the storm of my adolescent life. They didn't talk about my butt or make comments about my curly hair like they did at home. I was accepted for being me. It was a relief from having to hide. It was like they wanted to take their granddaughter out for a test drive, and I nailed it. Our new relationship felt special because I didn't have to share it with my brothers, my mom, or anyone else because I was their only granddaughter. That summer, they asked to take me on a road trip in their RV. I put my mom on the phone, and she quickly shooed me away so she could speak in private. I was nervous about what she might say. My mom was aggressive and curt in her delivery, and they were so sweet and kind, I felt like I had to protect them. When my mom emerged, she was grinning from ear to ear. Good news, she said. They're going to take you on a trip. And not just you, your brothers, too. My brothers, too? Why would they come? They aren't even related. How did this happen? Why are they coming? Because. It's a kid's trip. I didn't like this answer, but at least I could still go on the trip. I realized later that the real reason was because it was summertime and I was in charge of babysitting. You see, my household was chaotic. My mom did not enjoy motherhood, so I took on the role of mini mom caring for my two half brothers, cooking family meals, and cleaning ever since I was nine years old. So if I were ever gone, my mom would lose her childcare. Hopefully, Clarence and Tina were capable of managing two unruly, hellish, karate-obsessed animals. <laughs> One time, in an act of self-defense, I tried to block a roundhouse kick and ended up with my pinky dislocated at a 90-degree angle. Oh. Needless to say, I was looking forward to not babysitting. We'd be taking a two-week road trip from New Mexico up to Yellowstone National Park and down the California coast, making a stop at Disneyland on the way home. We were all thrilled. The first week was great. We made it up to Yellowstone and saw Old Faithful. I was the belle of the ball. They loved my dancing and singing improv. They laughed at all my jokes, and my brothers were well-behaved. I was right. I had nothing to worry about. I learned my grandparents liked to eat fresh tomatoes at every meal, they never listened to rap music. They, obe they obeyed all laws, as far as I could tell. Clarence even drove under the speed limit. I expected them to be more hood. I learned in school that black people spoke in Ebonics, and that was bad. Kids, and kids were being punished for using Ebonics. But Clarence and Tina spoke intelligently and in full sentences. I expected them to be more gangster, like the people I saw on TV. I thought they would be more threatening, but instead they were demure. I observed them as an outsider through non-black eyes, like I was studying them for a school project. They didn't scream at each other, even when they disagreed. They weren't violent or aggressive. The media had it all wrong. Being black wasn't something bad that I needed to be afraid of. It was something I could be proud of, something that was more familiar to me than I realized. They also never talked about my race or how I looked. I wasn't an other to them. They didn't worry about me being too black or what I secretly feared, not being black enough. They were more interested in who I was on the inside. It didn't matter to them that I was mixed. The topic never even came up. I was just me. I felt like I belonged. Then things started to shift. My brothers grew restless. The RV was mid-size and had plenty of room for two garden gnomes, but felt cramped with any additional guests. They were going nuts, jumping on things, breaking things, not following the rules, cursing, yelling, being the wild barbarians I knew them to be. I refused to step in and play mom. Clarence and Tina were capable adults. They would figure out how to contain the madness, only they couldn't. 
Eventually, my brothers rebelled in every way possible. They refused to listen, refused to get back on their RV when it was time to go. That was the final straw. We had a tight schedule with miles to cover each day. Spending an hour chasing my brothers around the campground was throwing off our plans. Clarence threatened to call my mom a few times before this, but he never did until this day. This time, he had had enough. I heard him on the phone. Susan, these boys just won't listen. Tina, Tina and I have tried everything and they're not behaving. I know you said sometimes you have to give them a spanking and I didn't want to have to do this, but I feel I have no other choice. I heard lots of yelling on the other end of the phone. My mom was screaming at Clarence. His body language changed. He looked sad, defeated. Okay, Susan, I'll bring them back to you. We'll head back to Corpus now. Head back to Corpus? We still had another week left of the trip. We hadn't even gone to Disneyland yet. Why are we ending early? What did my mom say? I was furious at her, furious at the boys for not listening. They weren't even supposed to be on this trip. Clarence explained that my mom was very upset at the idea of punishing my brothers with a spanking. She told him it was inappropriate and that he had no right to hit her children. We have to take them back to Corpus immediately. My mom frequently spanked us with a wooden spoon just the sight of the spoon leaving the drawer convinced us to cooperate. I didn't understand why it was okay for her to do, but not okay for him to do, especially given the circumstances. They were going to take us to Disney, and he wasn't even going to use the spoon. <laughs> I wish they hadn't come on the trip at all. I wish it was just us. When we got back, my mom greeted us coldly. It was clear we had interrupted her plans for the week. She and my brother quickly went inside while I said my goodbyes. Clarence and Tina drove off in the RV. I had a sinking feeling that they wouldn't be visiting again anytime soon. The next day, my brothers were playing with the kids who lived down the street. My mom called them the redneck kids because they had a truck parked outside their house held up by cinder blocks with a big Confederate flag sticker on the back. <laughs> After spending time with Clarence and Tina, this became more meaningful to me. I knew enough to know that this was not a welcome mat for brown people. I didn't like these kids. They were just as rowdy and insane as my little brother, so I always kept my distance. But on this day, they came to me. They were playing with my brothers in our front yard when I came outside. Nigger, they shouted. Your sister is a nigger. They had seen my black grandparents when they dropped us off the day before. and My brothers ratted me out, apparently not realizing the repercussions. My brother stood there in shock while the good old boy shouted, nigger, nigger, at me over and over again. I bolted back inside and froze. I was stunned. I was hurt and furious that my brothers didn't stand up for me. First, they ruined my trip, and now this? I was not prepared for this moment. I had just returned from a trip where I felt peace and safety being myself for the first time ever. Now, my cover was blown. My mom came home, I told her what happened. She immediately threw her purse on the dining room table and stomped down the street to give them a piece of her mind. I knew they were in for it. When she returned, she said simply, they won't be bothering you anymore. And they did stop for the most part, but always looked at me with daggers in their eyes from then on. It was jarring and confusing. This had been the first time I'd experienced racism outside of my family or directed at me from others because I was black. After all, I'd been pretending I was anything but black for so long, but now I've been outed. If I'd just gone on the trip alone without my brothers, we wouldn't have come back early and the neighborhood kids would have never known I was half black. But the truth was bound to come out at some point, and I realized that my being black was something I had to reconcile with. Not my family, my friends, or the local rednecks. I had to take ownership of my own. Identity, rather than placing the responsibility onto others. As time went by, I learned to love my curly hair and curvy body. I stopped pretending to be Mexican or Spanish, Egyptian or Puerto Rican, and I found joy in being myself. I even started calling people out on their racism. When someone made a comment about black people, I would ask them to repeat it, sometimes several times, and then let them know I was black and ask if they were talking about me. I would use the opportunity to teach them a lesson that you never know who you're talking to or about. 
I am the only black person in my family, and I take pride in that. I'm no longer anyone's little mulatto doll. Accepting my authentic self has been a lifelong journey that began with this trip. While it was not perfect, it gave me the permission I needed to step into my identity and stop playing a character. I got to take my mask off and be me. I was no longer a visitor. With them, I was home. It was a vacation from having to hide myself. It revealed my need to, to belong and feel connected, to not pass but be seen for me. My grandfather showed me that I am part of something larger than my mom and my brothers, part of something separate they could never understand. I never saw Clarence and Tina again. I'm not sure why, but I don't need to know why. I'm not sad about it. I'm genuinely grateful I had the experience with them. Even though our time together was brief, it gave me an example of what it's like to feel loved, accepted, and safe. So now, when I encounter other people like this, I know they are my kind of people. Amber Ligon, everyone.